ACS stands for acute coronary syndromes, right? So usually acute coronary syndromes is these three things, right? It's unstable angina, then you have NSTI, NSTE STEMI or, or non ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, and then you have STEMI, right? STEMI, ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. There is there is another uh, term you guys may have called, right? This is called stable angina. And stable angina, if you notice, is not part of ACS. Stable angina is uh, a state, right, where a person does some sort of a physical exertion or activity, and uh, chest pain is brought about doing that. And when they rest and relax, that chest pain goes away. So I can give you an example. Let's say a uh, guy um, walks up, you know, three flights of stairs, and upon while walking up three flights of stairs, he develops ischemic chest pain, right? Re uh, uh, he has pain in the chest, perhaps it radiates to his left arm or jaw, but the moment he sits down, right, uh, relaxes, the pain goes away, right? Or uh, maybe the doctor prescribed him his own nitroglycerin medication, he takes the nitroglycerin, he sits down, relaxes, the pain goes away. That is uh, stable angina, and the, usually the person knows roughly what type of activity will bring it on, right? They know that if they walk up three flights that this will cause it. So they try to not do uh, those things, right? But, uh, and what's important is stable angina is not part of acute coronary syndromes. So uh, ACS only encompasses these three things, unstable angina, non-ST segment elevation MI, and ST segment elevation MI. So unstable angina is usually chest discomfort and pain brought uh, during rest. You're not really uh doing much of a physical exertion or unstable angina maybe if let's say a guy who you know he took him three flights of stairs to get chest pain all of a sudden after one flight he has a change of status where he starts to develop that pain right so his narrowing of the artery is now bigger so he's now progressing from stable to unstable angina so unstable usually brought on rust uh and you have ischemic chest pain the, the 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 difference between these two and this one is that uh, the major difference is this, right? If you go to you know your doctor, they take your blood work, right? They you know for see you know during your physical exam, they take they they check your blood, right? Normally, the uh, proteins, right, and enzymes that are found in specific organs, we do not expect them to free flow in the blood, right? They they are housed in those organs for reasons. Now, if we find those enzymes free floating in the blood, usually that tells us there is an injury to that organ, right? So, if let's say uh, there is uh, proteins and enzymes in your heart, such as troponin and uh, CKMB found in your heart, we don't expect it to find in your blood work. So, if we, we check your blood work and we see that free floating in your blood, perhaps your your heart had an injury, an insult. So the major distinction between unstable angina and NSTEMI and STEMI is that in unstable angina, right, there is no elevation of troponin on C or CKMB. So there's no enzymes that are free floating. In NSTEMI and STEMI, right, those enzymes are now free floating in the blood. And the other thing, uh, what separates them, uh, you guys are going to learn in your skills how to do a 12 DKG, right, how to place the limb leads. Right, how to acquire 12 DKG? Maybe you already did that skill. So the other, the, the difference that subdivides and STEMI and STEMI is that in STEMI, as the name suggests, you have ST segment elevation, right? And the 12 DKG will show that. So the 12 DKG, right, will have elevation of the ST segment. So this portion of the EKG will be elevated. Where on and STEMI, you will not have elevation. That's why it's called non-ST segment elevation. Right. So just to go back, acute coronary syndromes is three things. It's unstable angina, usually brought on uh, during rest or change from stable um, status right, to this. And you do not have troponins or CKMB leakage in the blood. So if they check your blood, your blood work is fine. Um, you will not have ST segment elevation here. And then you have non-ST segment elevation and ST segment elevation. The major distinction here is that you have... Uh, elevation of a 12 DKG of the ST segment, 
in both of these, you will have enzymes that are now free floating in the blood. So you'll have positive troponin and CKMB if they check your blood work. So at this point, at this point, we say person has suffered a myocardial infarction. So if if they got number one, number two, they have a heart attack, right? Number one, uh, this one here is not yet, right? So they th at this portion they they don't have heart attack yet, but here number one, number two, they're definitely having a heart attack, right? This is just uh, showing you, uh, right, the difference between, I was telling you, stable versus unstable angina, right? So uh, here we see a normal person, right? He has no no narrowing, right? He can exercise. Here we see moderate narrowing. So this person starts to develop uh, chest pain due to exertion. So this is... Uh, Called stable angina if he has it right so he starts to have chest pain and then he rests and it goes away right we say it's stable and this guy is having severe narrowing to the point that he's reading the book he's not really exerting himself right and all of a sudden he starts to have chest pain right uh, uh usually is indicative of unstable angina right so at, at rest right uh so here uh they'll show you um uh calvin you had a question yeah, so at rest, um, is it more of like an increasing pressure in the, in the chest, or like is it more of just like as like a like a stable, steady pain? So, so he may he may progressively have increasing pain, right? So during the unstable angina, what's usually occurring is as following. So so good question. So you're right at this point, right? So he may be resting, and during the rest. He has this prolonged chest pain that's now greater than 20 minutes. And very, what's very important about it, he wasn't doing any physical activity. You ask him, what were, you know, when you do your OPQRST, OPQRSTI questions, you say, you know, what were you doing when this pain started? He says, nothing. I was just sitting here watching television. I was just sitting here reading a book. So it did not come about by exertion. The pain may be, the way he describes the pain, he may describe it like we talked about. He may be vice-like, pressure-like. Elephant sitting on my chest, right? Uh, dull pain, right? So they may use those descriptors. Uh, it may be uh, longer than 20 minutes in duration. And usually, right, uh, it's not going away by rest. So the pain is, is there, right? Uh, the other thing, what may happen is they, the person may take his nitroglycerin uh, pills and the pain still doesn't go away, right? So this is hallmark of unstable angina, right? So the very bare, bare minimum you should know the distinction. If, if on the other hand, if the person uh, sits down and the pain goes away, right, or he takes his nitroglycerin, the pain goes away, he still is in the state of stable angina, right? So here we talk about unstable angina and how do you know you're at level of unstable? So one we talked about, it's at rest and the pain is prolonged. We could have new onset. So that basically means a uh, person who was able, right, to let's say climb three flights is now can only do one flight of stairs. Um, so he's, he's now able to perform less, less physical activity, right? So it limits, uh, markedly limits the ordinary physical activity. So before you could do, let's say one to two blocks, one flight, and now you decrease that significantly, right? And then uh, you have uh, increasing angina, basically the previously diagnosed stable angina is becoming progressively worse, longer duration, right? Uh, uh, and um, you could for a longer time. So you could walk class, and for a longer time, your your chest pain is there. So all those are consistent with being unstable angina. Right. So uh, unstable angina still still is not acute myocardial infarction. What unstable angina is is that his narrowing of this lumen right is so much so much that the blood flow is not going distally. But the the vessel wall has not ruptured. This has not ruptured in unstable angina. But once you transition into you know and STEMI and STEMI, this is where we're talking about right acute myocardial infarction. This is you see how there's no right there's no flow of blood. There's nothing that can go through it, right? So now we have thrombus formation. Why do you have thrombus formation? You have rupture of the right tunica intima or tunica media where the the position of uh, lipids were, and now the thrombus is, a, is coming in to plug up the hole, right? And we see this. Why do we see ischemia? Is because even though, let's say, 
the thrombus is here. Let's say the blood flow to this area is okay, but this area that's distal, right, that's distal, is not getting the good supply of oxygen. And now we see that, right, um, person is becoming ischemic, right? So STEMI. Uh, some, uh, one, the reason why I want to make sure you understand these terms, sometimes you will call RC, RCC desk and they'll say, well, hospital 41, hospital 13, hospital 12, whatever it may be, they'll say they, they, uh, their STEMI center is on diversion. Or they'll say the STEMI center uh, is not accepting any patients, right? So what, is, what does that mean, right? So that you're not confused, like what, what is STEMI? I have no idea what they're talking about. When they say, you know, if the STEMI center is on diversion or they, they are no longer accepting patients, it means that a person who is having a heart attack and they need uh, a catheterization, we'll talk about what that is, it's going to be done in the STEMI lab or uh, cath lab, right? And uh, the reason why they call it STEMI center is that those patients who have ST segment elevation, you diagnose it via 12 DKG, right? They go there. If they tell you the STEMI center is on diversion, think back, right? Yeah, I cannot, means that if a person's having a heart attack and they tell me STEMI center is on diversion, maybe that's not the best hospital to be taking the patient to. Right? So that's, that's why I have this here. Right, so this is uh, this is how the patient will tell you they're feeling. So if you tell me, sir, can you describe what you're feeling? Right, their description will be something like this, and uh, their words can differ. They could say wise like, they could say dull pain, they could say elephant sitting on my chest. It feels crushing like, it feels like suffocating. Right, so they may use whatever uh, terms they they want in order to describe it. Right? But for your purposes, what you guys need to be familiar uh, with is usually this pain, this pain, right, will differ from, let's say, uh, you know, musculoskeletal pain where uh, he does some physical activity and then the pain comes on. So let's say if I, you know, injured my shoulder or my chest and I move my arm only then this pain comes on. This pain is going to be there regardless if I move my arm up and down. So this pain is consistent. The other important thing is this pain does not go away with inspiratory effort. So if I take a big breath in and I take big breath out, this will not change, right, this chest pain that I'm having. So if it's acute coronary syndrome, right, so if, the, if it's acute coronary syndrome, uh, it's unstable angina or it's unstemmy or it's STEMI, right, the pain will be there regardless if I take a big breath in or I take big breath out. It's not pleuritic in nature, right? So very important. It's also not positional. So if a person sits down, lays down, right, or he stands up, the pain does not go away. So for those cases, we say when you have true ACS, true chest discomfort, secondary to acute coronary syndromes, the pain is not reproducible. The pain does not change on inspiratory effort, right? It's not pleuritic in nature. And the, and the pain uh, is, does not change uh, in, posi in positional uh, of the patient, right? So it's very important to keep that in mind. So in simpler terms, Mr. Nikolai, um, it's wait, what you're trying to say is like um, the pain, the pain is still, still, is still um, continuous. At, as in, like if he's he's in supine Fowler's, or if he's just sitting up, or if he's just just regularly standing up, and the pain doesn't change. That's what you're trying to say, really. Exactly. So, so the reason why I say this, right? Sometimes you may have a, pa a patient who says, "I have chest pain," right? We're going to talk about, uh, for ACS, we have specific treatments, right? We're going to talk about what those are, right? Usually, uh, we're going to help them with aspirin, nitroglycerin, and so forth. But you have to first assess the pain and determine, is it acute coronary syndrome or it's something else? For, for example, let's say you have a guy who is maybe stacking boxes and he starts, he says, oh, yeah, I have chest pain. But really, right, that pain only goes on when he moves his arm. Maybe he injured his shoulder or his pack, right, when he was stacking boxes. And the pain is there when he moves his arm forward. So the pain is is uh, is secondary to movement, right? In acute coronary syndromes, the pain will be there regardless if you move your arm, right? The pain, in acute coronary syndromes, the pain will be re there regardless if you take a big breath in or out. The pain will be there regardless if you lay down, sit down, stand up, do any of those things. So the pain is consistent. It's there. It does not go away, right? So that's very important for you to understand, right? Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, so the um, other stuff that they will say, especially when the person is having myocardial infarction, right? 
So you will have your classic symptoms that I showed you, but you may also have your um, symptoms that I'll describe that are not so classic. So besides the left arm, yeah, the pain can go to the right arm, absolutely. Can it, can it go to the shoulder and right arm? Definitely. Can it be on both arms and shoulders? Certainly, right? Uh, can it be associated with exertion? It can be. So the person uh, uh, was um, doing physical activity. Some examples I gave you, let's say some, you know, a heavy snowfall, the guy goes out, uh, takes a shovel, you know, does, you know, shoveling the snow, all of a sudden starts to develop chest pain. Comes home, sits down, the pain doesn't go away. It's been 15 minutes, 20 minutes, the pain doesn't go away. He calls 911, right? Uh, this is your classic sign, radiates to the left arm, associated with diaphoresis. Diaphoresis means sweating. So why you have sweating? Your sympathetic nervous system is firing, right? Associated with nausea and vomiting. Why? Because the heart uh, is uh, close to your GI tract and it can irritate, right? So you may have nausea and vomiting there as well. Uh, worse than previous uh, anginal episodes. So if they're, if they're truly having a myocardial infarction, it will be worse than the angina um, episode that they're having where they sit down and the pain goes away. Now the pain does not go away. If they had previous heart attack, they will say it, it's, it, it might be similar, right? Uh, often described as pressure, right? So they will say, feels like elephant sitting on my chest. Uh, uh, by the way, if you see someone clutching their chest like this, that's a classic Levine sign. We call it Levine sign. Levine sign is, is a classic pathognomonic sign of uh, acute coronary syndrome. So if you see anyone clutching their chest and they're saying, I feel chest pain, it feels like elephants sitting on my chest, be very, very worried. That's, this is the real deal. So now, right, we, we, we saw with the thrombus formation, right? Uh, so what happens is uh, now they are developing this zone of necrosis. Basically, um, this is where the injury is progressing through. It's progressing through the walls, right? Remember, I showed you a, uh, a picture of the heart. We said inside was the endocardium, then it was the myocardium, then, then it was the epicardium, right, as the vessel progresses. So you see here, right, uh, the injury is going through the all these walls as it goes through the walls and if the tissue is necrotic and the tissue is dying you're definitely going to see ekg changes right you're not responsible to know th these right uh, the reason why they called st segment elevation mi is basically this is the st st uh right uh, waves the s wave the t wave from here to here they make the st segment and here you see how it's elevated so basically that's what the doctors the paramedics right, are looking for in the EKG to see, right, uh, where the injury is. Uh, uh, this is the reason why you guys are going to be learning to do a 12 lead EKG. Uh, some of you may be working in areas, uh, in rural areas, such as upstate, right, where there's not enough paramedics. Your service may buy you a, a 12 lead EKG capable monitor. That's why you're learning the skill. So in your protocol, what you may have is you may have a patient who is having chest pain, Right, he will describe, you know, the same way, like radius to the left arm, to the shoulder, and so forth. In your in your area, you may not have enough paramedics. So what your service may do is you may do a 12 EKG, and if the monitor flags it saying uh, MI, you will send it to a doctor in the hospital, and then the doctor doctors will read it and they will say, okay, yeah, this person is certainly having heart attack. They will look at the EKG and they'll say, okay, transport this guy to the STEMI center. So they say take him to the STEMI center, right, where they can do you know, the, the open up his vessel. So we'll talk about what this is, but so you guys understand what we're talking about. So you may do a 12 lead EKG. We'll show you how to put the leads on. You're not responsible to interpret, right? So if you want to learn how to interpret, <laughs> there is a, a class called paramedic class you could enroll. But uh, if the monitor flags it as a MI, uh, you may transmit it to the hospital and the doctors after looking at it may, may tell you, okay, transport this guy to the hospital. They are showing that they're having a ischemic event, right? So uh, for, your, for your purposes, right, uh, what you need to be cognizant of, you don't need to have the interpretation, but you'll definitely learn the placement of the limb leads. You'll learn the placement of the EKG in your labs uh, and, uh, you know, uh, how um, it's done, right? Now, let's talk about patient assessment, right? So uh, we're going to be doing uh, an assessment for these patients. We're going to be doing a primary assessment and a secondary assessment. Specifically, we're going to be doing uh, a medical patient assessment for the patients who are having myocardial infarction, right? This diagram I took from an old uh, 
EMT uh, basic manual, right? So I want to, uh, you could screenshot, but I will I'm gonna circle here, right? A cardiac, right? Cardiac respiratory. So you see your OPQRST is only pertinent for cardiac respiratory. All other uh, conditions like altered mental status, right? Allergic reaction, poisoning, and so forth. They do not have OPQRST. They have different questions that you're asking. And uh, why is this important? OPQRST is specifically pertinent to the myocardial uh, and respiratory conditions. So uh, I'm giving you this right list. You could screenshot it. This You could use it when you're doing your medical assessments to give you an idea what to ask if you have those patients who do not have chest pain. But for this lecture, let's focus on those who do have chest pain. So let's. I'm going to ask you some of those questions and you could tell me. So. So onset, right? So what does onset refer to for cardiac, cardiac specific chest pain? So let me give you a, a patient presentation. Let's say you respond to a 65 year old male who complains of chest pain. So in onset, what are you asking him? And, and you guys can answer freely. When did the pain start? So, uh, so Carlos saying uh, onset, right? Uh, when does the pain start, right? So yeah, uh, so, or the other thing uh, you you were asking, right? Uh, what were you doing when the pain began, right? So the guy may say, okay, you know, I was stacking boxes, right? So uh, that was physical activity, or you could say I went out to the driveway to plow, you know, to shovel snow. Right, so it's brought on by physical exertion, or they may say, I was just sitting here watching television, so it was brought on rest, onset, very good. So then provocation, what, what am I asking in the provocation step? Uh, does anything you do make it better or worse? Good, right, so anything you do make it better or worse, and this is very important, right? If, the, if they tell you, right, you know what, uh, nothing I do makes it but or worse, the pain is there. I'm right away thinking acute coronary syndrome. But if the guy says, you know what, if I take a big breath, pain goes, there's pain. But when I exhale, I have no chest pain, right? So um, at that point, I'm, I'm starting to think maybe it's not really acute coronary syndromes. Same way if the guy says, you know, I, when I move my arm forward during the actual motion, I have chest pain. But when I sit down and have no motion, the, there's no chest pain, right? So usually cardiac pain, that's brought on by acute coronary syndromes will not uh, go away with breathing, will not go away with movement, will not go away with positioning. The provocation, anything you do makes it uh, go away. So ACS is going to be there, right? No matter what. So quality, what am I, what am I asking in quality? From a scale of one to 10, how bad is the pain? So, so quality is, is, is not the scale. So quality, when we get to the quality, this is where you want to ask them to describe the pain. And try not to uh, uh, have it open-ended question. So what I would like to say, sir, can you please describe in your words how are you feeling? And the reason why you don't want to tell them, does it feel sharp, dull, because you don't want to put anything, uh, uh, any words in their mouth. You want them have have to describe the pain. So I'll say, can you describe in your own words how it feels? So they'll say, you know what? It feels like pressure. It feels like an elephant sitting on my chest. It feels vice-like. It feels like it's crushing, right? So they will be describing the pain in their own words, right? That's what I want, right? What, what is radiation? What I'm asking about radiation. Does the pain move to any other part? Very good. So we talked about, right, radiation. Radiation can be pain moving, but not only that, right? We talked about the classic, right? Classic being... Uh, sh uh, left arm, right shoulder, left jaw, but it can also be right side. It can go to the neck, right? Uh, it can be atypical as well. You can go to the back. So do not dismiss if it's not classical. Classical, right? Left side of the body, left arm, left shoulder, but it can also go to the neck, can go to the back, right? Especially in females and patients who have diabetes, right? You may have non-classical uh, uh, presentation, right? Uh, uh, so what is severity? That will be the scale one to ten. Yeah. So Carlos, very good. That will be one. It will not be one to ten. I'll tell you why. You guys like to use one to ten, but it will not be one to ten. And the reason why it's not going to be one to ten is because the moment you say one to ten, you assume they have some pain. So always use zero to ten. So you. So the way I like to ask, I say zero is no pain at all, 
and 10 is the most pain you have ever felt in your life. Can you describe this for me? So do not use one to 10, right? Use zero to 10. And it's also gonna be important when you give them treatments, right? We're gonna, we're gonna learn in treatments shortly, we're gonna give, uh, right? We're gonna give aspirin. We're gonna may have assist with nitro. So if initially I'll say on zero to 10, how bad is your pain? The guy says, oh, you know, it's 10. Uh, the worst pain I have ever felt in my life. And then after I give him some treatment, perhaps I give him nice, I give him aspirin and I also assist him with nitroglycerin. I will ask him, okay, after we give you these medications, right? After I give you aspirin, how bad is the pain? The guy says, oh, you know what? Uh, pain is now maybe uh, a nine, right? And then you'll say, okay, I'm going to assist you with your nitroglycerin. Here's a nitroglycerin. You reassess the pain. What is the pain now? The guy says, okay, no, the pain is now an eight. So I could see the trending has come, came down from, from 10 to eight. So it's important to track, to trend. So severity zero to 10, do not use one to 10. Right? What is time? What, what is time? How long ago did the pain start? How long ago, right? So you want to say, when did this, this pain begin? And I want to, I, I usually write down, right, on my ACR. So the guy says, you know what? It began an hour ago. I look at my watch, right? Let's say it's now 8.51 p.m. So the guy says the pain began 7.51 p.m. This is where it began, right? This is where he started to notice. Why do you think it's important to establish time of onset? Why is this time so important? Is it something to just to write on my ACR? No, maybe the pain is getting worse when it started. Maybe it got better. Maybe staying the same. You don't yeah, know. Th that is true, but uh, we could we could assess that in severity, right? Zero to ten. But why why is the time when 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 it began so important? Why do I want to have precise time? So th the reason why you want to have precise time is that when you take this guy to the hospital, then they will, then the triage nurse will ask you, right, what's the time? The reason why they, they ask you the time is that the hospital itself will have treatments that's time sensitive. So maybe they have door to needle time, 90 minutes. So they have 90 minutes to maybe put a, a stent, right? So maybe you are exceeding the time frame. So they, they need to think about that, right? So it's always important to establish the time the symptoms began. And I always write down in my, my ACR. They will definitely ask you this time in the hospital when you arrive. So always have that. And then the final thing is intervention. What do you suppose this is? What is interventions? Everything you do for the patient. Not not what you not what you do, but what the patient did before your arrival. Some sometimes what may happen is this. Uh, uh, patient is having chest pain. Some someone, family member, right? Or maybe he is at work. Somebody calls nine one one, right? They call nine one one. I don't know if you saw the, you know, um, we 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 were doing right CPR class, right? You call nine one one, and the dispatcher will say, okay, you guys guys grab the AED, grab the first aid kit, right? Oh, he's having chest pain. Okay, go ahead. From the first aid, give him three hundred twenty five aspirin, right? So if you arrive and the guy says, you know what, I called nine my, you know my coworker called 911 and they told me to take 325 milligrams aspirin right and he re he just took it and that's what he says he did i will look at the bottle to inspect certainly right it's aspirin right it's not enteric coated right it's, it's not for the gi tract uh and uh I look it's not expired if that occurred and he did it right before your arrival i will not give my uh 325 because i will document right a uh, patient was um, informed by dispatch to give 325 from first aid kit, patient self-administered nitro uh, aspirin, uh, and uh, it's not entire coated, right? And patient took it, you know, five minutes before our arrival. So it's very important to to do that. The other thing, the, the interventions. What if the guy says, you know, I took five nitros, no relief. Five nitros, no relief. Do you think do you think giving him six one is gonna help him? Right, probably not. So, if if the guy says I took five nitros, no relief, I'm probably not gonna be assisting him, wasting time with the you know with the sixth one. Uh, and I certainly at this point I'm thinking right, he's probably having a real deal heart attack. So uh, be cognizant of that, right? So very important to document and assess what they took, right? Any questions about uh, OPQRST questions that 
is pertinent to the cardiac um, assessment. Okay. So if there's no questions about that, right, I also want to know, right, in your uh, secondary assessment, we also do a physical, focused physical, right, right, right like this, yellow pen. So we do focused. Focused uh, physical assessment, that's actually one of the critical criteria in your patient assessment. Oftentimes, if you, if you fail the station, you do not perform a focused exam. Can anyone tell me on a physical exam, after, after I did all my questions, I did my sample, I did my OPQRST, right? What am I assessing on a focused physical exam for a guy who, right, is having chest pain, like let's say this guy here? What, what am I checking? You could give me, if, if you know one or two, you could state one or two. Um, what do you think I'm going to check? JVD. So, J, so Carl says JVD, good, right? So JVD, very good, right? We talked about right side heart failure, right? So if you have, maybe your heart attack was on the right side. If you have right side uh, that's not pumping well, you may have jugular venous distension. So, so good, JVD. What else? What else can I check on this guy? Fro Froty spoon. Um, no. Say, say louder. Froty spoon. So for, for you, know, you, you may have, uh, if it's prolonged, but usually in a heart attack, they may not have free sputum per se, but that second, but what they may have, right? Uh, they may have uh, pulmonary edema. If, if there's a person had a massive heart attack on the left side and there's a backup of blood in the lungs, right? The first they will be manifesting as pulmonary edema. So I may hear uh, some fluid in the lungs. So I'll be, I'm checking his lung sounds, right? So uh, besides these things, right? So besides the JVD, I'm also checking for pedal edema on the legs. You see how his uh, they rolled up his uh, right pants. So I'm I'm actually gonna look. I'm gonna like to take my thumb and press down to see right if there is any pitting edema. I may check if there's sacral edema. I will check his skin right uh, to see right if he is showing signs of uh diaphoresis right if he's sweating uh i you can also use right we talked about uh you know your valves you could use your stethoscope you could even listen to the heart sound the apical sounds right you could hear some abnormal sounds i'm not expecting you to you know diagnose the murmurs but he may have murmurs right if there's prolapsed valves but at the bare minimum right focused physical exam the stuff that's here, right? You want to check for edema, you want to check for G JVD, you want to check for pulmonary edema, you want to check for, uh, you know, your lung sounds uh, in your secondary assessment, okay? So that's what we're doing. Uh, cardiac monitoring, and for your purposes, right, you're going to learn how to place this, these leads. Uh, you're going to place the limb leads uh, on the limbs. Uh, so this should be on the legs, truly, and then you're going to place your... Um, cardiac leads to look at the heart, uh, right? So now let's talk about treatment, right? So now you, uh, you uh, either, either you did a 12 EDKG and you're transmitting it to a doctor, let's say you're working somewhere rural, right? Where there's no paramedics or you called ALS, right? But ALS is still responding right there. We're gonna say ALS has not arrived yet. Uh, and this guy is having chest pain with all those signs and symptoms we talked about. So some of the treatments uh, we're gonna do, right? Uh, we're gonna talk about what they are. Before we administer any of those treatments, we wanna make sure we have these rights. Uh, during the skills lab, you pro probably learn about them. Uh, the best way to do this is not just to uh, rattle them off, right? right patient, right med, right dose, right route. Don't do that. Uh, what you wanna do is you wanna go one by one, right? And you know assess for those things. This will um, prevent you, or I would say, there's less chance of you making a mistake. Uh, and uh, you don't want to make a m mistake with a medication error. So how do, you know, how do you know you have the right patient? You have the right patient is the patient who meets indication. They're having chest pain. Uh, it does not go away, right? Uh, it's, they will say it's um, dull. 
pressure like radiating to the left arm, for example. So you have the patients who meets indications, right? So let's say you have Mr. Smith, 65 years old, right? Right, the right medication. So you're going to look in your protocol and your protocol will state the medications you're going to give. So if you're working in New York City, you're going to use your REMAC protocols. If you're working somewhere else, you're going to use this, the, those regional protocols, right? So you will look at the medication. So the medication will say, for example, aspirin. So you will take this medication. You want to make sure it's not expired, right? Uh, you want to look that it's not entire coded. Uh, the protocol will also state the, the, the dose, right? So let's say it says 325 milligrams. Make sure, very important, you don't say for baby tablets or, you know, something like this along those lines. That's not a dose. Your dose is always going to be in milligrams, grams, all right, and uh, micrograms, stuff like that. So your protocol, which is your standing order, will have the dose in milligrams. Do not ever write on your ACR for baby tablets or because I don't know how many milligrams you administered. Right, the route your protocol will also tell you. Right, so the route maybe this medication is going to go uh, PO and he's going to chew it. Right, so he's going to go PO and he's going to chew it. Uh, right time, the time was going to be now. Why? Because you determined that he meets indications. You're going to document on your ACR. So on the ACR, you'll say, you know, you will usually put the time. So let's say, you know, 1851, we gave aspirin. And we gave 325 milligrams right to the person. So this is usually your ACR will have. It's usually digital now. So this is the six rights. You want to go through them. I would usually confirm with your partner. So less chance of you making a, a mistake, right? This is the New York City regional protocols. They mimic the New York State protocols. So you will see, right? Uh, we're going to check ABC's vital signs, right? Perform your basics. Uh, and then you notice, right? If the patient is having uh, chest pain, right, we're going to give, here they write 324 milligrams uh, uh, PO, right, PO, per os. Uh, basically means per mouth, oh, by mouth, they want to chew. Why is it 324, not 325? Uh, if your service carries 81 milligrams tablets, right? So 84 times, 81 times 4 is going to be, right? 324 milligrams. But uh, American Heart Association recommends 325. But uh, that's not a big deal for you guys. What I want to make sure you do not write in your ACR, do not write for, for baby tablets. Even though that's how many you're going to give them, you're going to give them four if it's 81 milligrams, right? But make sure your ACR says 324 milligrams. You're going to look at your protocol when you are documenting this. Any questions about that? Right. So uh, you're also going to request ALS assistance. Um, right. Um, and you don't want to delay transport. What that means is that you give your treatments, you give your aspirin as a first medication. You start to package your patient, means you put them in a stair chair, you're putting them on your stretcher. And as you call ALS, you'll say, you know, I would like ALS uh, backup to my location. You're moving them to the ambulance. That doesn't mean you sitting down on the couch next to the guy, relaxing, waiting for ALS to arrive. Uh, the reason why this is important is that if ALS does not arrive upon upon uh, you coming downstairs and you determine that, you know, your arrival to the hospital, right, a cath lab capable cardiac center is faster than a ALS arrival, uh, you would want to start moving to the hospital, right? Also, if available, they say you may assist your patients with nitroglycerin as long as they're having chest pain, right? And their systolic blood pressure is above 120 systolic. So you check your blood pressure. You want to make sure it's at least 120 millimeters of mercury on the systolic pressure. <coughs> right? uh, if, if their blood pressure drops below 120, that's it. You are no longer uh, able to administer any nitroglycerin doses to these patients. Right? My, advice to, my advice to you guys uh, is this. When you're giving this medication, make sure the patient is sitting down or they are on your stretcher. Uh, some patients may uh, have a profound effect where they vasodilate so much, they may lose consciousness. And if you don't have ALS there yet, you, you do not have ability to start IV access and, uh, you know, to give them fluids. So make sure the patient is at least sitting down. Um, th this medication 
cause profound vasodilation and the may and the patient may complain of a headache right that's basically secondary to the dilation of the vessels of the veins uh uh what does als do when they arrive right they will do the 12 ddkg right they will determine if the patient meets the criteria for the STEMI center right you you are not gonna um um be interpreting 12 leads some if you work let's say in a rural area like i talked about some services may give you a monitor you will do the ekg and send it to the doctor the doctor will look at it and say okay yeah this guy is having a STEMI. STEMI stands for st segment elevation right st segment elevation myocardial infarction and they will be taking them to the pci this is basically a per percutaneous coronary intervention that's the cath lab capable facility okay uh, we can administer also nitroglycerin uh, uh, for, for, for them. The main reason, uh, uh, let me ask you this question. What is the main reason you call ALS for these patients? What is the main reason you call ALS for these patients in New York City area? What do you guys think? They, they say to you, right, in here, right, request ALS. Why am I calling ALS? What is the main reason? Anyone know? So they can take over. <laughs> so they can take over. So Ellen says so they can take over. So th th that that is not the correct answer. Why why do you think I'm calling ALS? So I got a guy chest pain, right? Uh, checks all the boxes, right? I gave him aspirin, I called ALS. So the reason why you call ALS is not that we have anything fancy that we're gonna give them. It's not like we have fancy drugs. We have the same aspirin, we have the same you know, uh, nitroglycerin, if the patient is prescribed, it's the same stuff. The major, major difference why you call it ALS in your city area is this. Because we might need CPR? Well, C CPR, hopefully you, you are trained in CPR. So out of all the providers, I hope the EMTs in this class are well-versed with CPR. Right. Uh, uh, the reason why you call ALS is not for the CPR. The reason why you call ALS is this: if I, if the ALS can do a 12 EDKG and they determine there is a STEMI, right? They determine there's this. They can call right away and transmit the CKG, and they can take the patient straight to the STEMI center, bypassing the ER emergency department. So basically, think of it like this: time is muscle, uh, time is hard muscle. So the faster I can take them to the STEMI center the faster they can open the coronary arteries. The main reason you call ALS is not so they can take over. It's not so they can give any fancy medicine. It's that they can do a 12 EDKG and they could see if there's an injury to the vessel wall, to the heart, I should say, and uh, send this to the uh, doctor so they can open the STEMI center for them. And they'll go straight to the STEMI center. This is why you call ALS. Uh, some things you want to be uh, cognizant of, right? Nitroglycerin. Make sure you ask the person if they're taking any erectile dysfunction medicines. If they took medications like Viagra, uh, uh, the Vitra Cialis, you cannot give nitroglycerin for the past 72 hours. So you cannot give nitro because it's going to cause profound vasodilation. You want to make sure your aspirin, right? The ones you carry is certainly going to be non entire coated. But if the guy, the, the patient says, yeah, I called 911. They advised me to take nitro. Uh, sorry, they advised me to take aspirin from the first aid kit. Make sure it's not entire coated. It doesn't have a coating, right? That uh, on it for, for, from for, that um, encapsulates the pill, so it gets broken broken down uh, in the GI tract, right? So you want non entire coated because they want the patient to chew it, so it gets absorbed to the mucosa, right? So uh, that's what's important. Yeah, you're certainly going to ask the the patient if they have allergies to aspirin. If they say we have uh, GI issues, like we have ulcers, right? Uh, the GI complaints, it's not contraindications. So that's not a contraindication. If they have, I, they say I'm allergic, I have hypersensitivity to aspirin, yes, then you cannot give aspirin. Make sure you document it, right? Uh, so this is what you want to be cognizant of um, uh, for, on the BLS level. So no nitro if they took any erectile dysfunction within the past 72 hours, right? If aspirin, they are allergic to it, do not give it. If they say I have GI distress, it's, that's not an allergy. Uh, make sure aspirin, if they took any, that's not entire coated, right? So that's what you want to make sure. Uh, you want The reason why you want to call ALS is this. 
You want ALS to do a 12 EDKG very quickly, so they take them to the STEMI capable PCI center, right? Uh, in terms of your treatment, we talked about this, right? So uh, if if you use your pulse ox, if the saturation is less than 90, right, you're gonna, and they have respiratory distress, you're gonna give them oxygen, you can give them via nasal cannula, you could give them via non rebreather mask, right? So um, this is what you're gonna give, right? The next, use your pulse ox to trite it, to titrate it. The next medication we're gonna talk about, right, is aspirin. We said 324, right, or 325. Um, the way this works is stops platelets from uh, aggregating. So it stops more platelets from coming to that thrombus plaque and forming that uh, platelet plug. Uh, American Heart Association, AHA, says anything between 162 and 325. In New York City, right, we said we give 324. This is how the medications look, right? Uh, but that you're going to practice, they say chewable aspirin. This is done in terra coated, 81 milligrams you see here. So 81 times four, right? You're going to give 324 milligrams. So you give four tablets if it's 81 milligrams per tablet. Uh, so the function of the medication, the way it works, right? I said it uh, stops platelets from aggregating. Out of all the medications, I, this is very, very important. Out of all the medications you could give, right? Uh, oxygen assisted with nitroglycerin. Aspirin is the only only medication that reduces mortality by 20 to 23%. More, more, mortality means death, right? So if a person is having a heart attack and you give this medication early on, right? You have you decrease their chance of a uh, chance of dying by 25%. Nitroglycerin doesn't do this. Uh, oxygen doesn't do this, right? The only medication that does it is aspirin. That's why you want to assess for acute coronary syndrome signs and symptoms, and you want to give this medicine early on, right, in your uh, disease process. So aspirin, first-line drug, right? Uh, this is basically, this was a study published in the American Heart Association, and here, right, the one I highlighted, they say after five weeks, they determined that aspirin uh, reduces 23% of vascular mortality, and has almost 50% reduction in the risk of non-fatal reinfarction. So there's less chance of them getting a heart attack and non-fatal stroke, right? But for our purposes, this is what we want to focus on, right? Uh, so aspirin, right, we talked about what it does. So it stops platelets from uh, uh, adhering. It does it via thromboxin A2, right? It's a COX, COX cyclooxygenase inhibitor. Um, so thromboxin A2, this is where it works. Cyclooxygen inhibitor for your purposes. For your purposes, what you need to know, it stops platelets recruitment. Stops. See how it works here? It stops platelets from coming and clumping together. So you don't you you are reducing the chance of increasing, right? The next medication is nitro, right? This is how it looks. It tells you 0 0.4 milligrams. Um, sublingual. Right. Uh, what is the contraindication? Right. So we said low blood pressure for your protocol. You you do not want to give it less than one twenty systolic. Uh, in American Heart Association, they also use the following. Right. Extreme bradycardia, and extreme tachycardia. So heart rate less than fifty or heart rate less than hundred. Uh, the reason why you also want to do this is remember we said we have preload, preload. Right. So if the if the this medication caused significant vasodilation, so let's say this was your venous system, right? And this is your heart, and I give this medication, and this was right your uh, superior vena cava, and this was your inferior vena cava, right? And I give this medication, and I increase your yeah increase your amount right of dilation. There's more dilation. There's less preload coming in. The preload goes down because of profound vasodilation. If the preload goes down, right, and you also have significant bradycardia, a significant tachycardia, and I give you this medication and I increase your, your I, I vasodilate you even more, you will not be able to mount a response. You will not be able to mount a response, and what's going to happen is uh, you will bottom out. So the, those patients will syncopy. If they're having right ventricular heart attack, you may not want to give this medicine. 
you would not know this unless you know how to lead, read 12 lead EKGs. So the paramedics will determine that. So you're only assisting with this medication, um, but you will not be able to know if they have right ventricular involvement, right? So when we give nitroglycerin is, is if the patient is complaining of chest, chest pain, their systolic is still about 120, and this is when you are assisting with it, right? Uh, one thing you want to know, right, the nitro, right, does not re reduce mortality. The only medicine that will reduce mortality is aspirin, as we talked about. So that's the first line of drug you want to give. So if you have a 65-year-old male, right, who has a 20-year history of coronary artery disease, he has high blood pressure and diabetes, right? Uh, do you think he his vessels look like this or more looking like this? And let's say he's also a smoker. The second one? Yeah, the second one, right? So he has way more deposition of uh, uh, atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis hardening and plaque deposition, right? Uh, and his uh, vessels are not so elastic, right? So they're not very pliable. So those patients uh, who have those risk factors we talked about, right? Non-modifiable risk factors, right? So all these are not mo modifiable, especially right, uh, the being male, right, older in age, um, right, uh, and if he has all those risk factors, he's going to be on, on my list higher up, that if he tells me I'm, I'm having chest pain that's radiating to my left arm, I'm now suspecting that he might be, in fact, having uh, acute coronary syndromes, and based on the protocols, right, the, the moment I determine, we talked about what's the number one drug if he that I would like to give as long as he's not allergic to it. What's the number one drug? Aspirin. Aspirin, right? We're going to give 324 per REMAC uh, on your state protocols, right? And then if he has if he has nitroglycerin that he's prescribed, you want to confirm that his systolic is about 120. No nitroglycerin usage within 70, uh, sorry, no, um, erectile dysfunction medication usage within 72 hours so you can assist it with nitroglycerin given that his systolic is about 120 right uh, we're going to call als for him so that they can do early 12 edkgs so that they could take him to the cath lab capable facility right uh and um uh for your right for your purposes what you guys want to make sure right when you have a patient like this do not just sit at home you know, waiting for ALS arrival, start your packaging, start to move them to the ambulance because we said time is muscle and time is myocardial muscle, right? Uh, and this is what you want to be cognizant of. Uh, so I want to show you some things, right? Uh, what happens is, right, what, what we do is if they had this clot that formed here and this, they had no perfusion and they actually suffered a myocardial infarction, right? Uh, in the hospital, what they're gonna do, we talk about PCI, PCI capable facility. They're gonna basically go with a special device, right? And they're gonna feed it through the aorta. They're gonna go all the way up. And based on the uh, EKGs that they saw and based on right the images you see here, right? They will push dye. And the dye will basically highlight on the screen. They will see where the there is occlusion, right? So the moment they determine which vessel is occluded, they're going to put a stent. So on, on this vessel, they're going to put a stent. The reason why they're putting a stent, right, is that uh, they want to make sure, right, that they can open up, right, that specific wall, right? If, uh, if they're able to open up that wall, then you could have distal perfusion. So here you see, right, they basically lay a catheter, they expand that wire the balloon, they expand the mesh, and here you have the stent. And now you could have red blood cells that are flowing, right? This is how the cath lab looks like. There's usually a cardiologist that he's performing the procedure. Here they went through the femoral axis through the groin, and uh, right, this is what is going to happen. 